Psalm 91 tonight. Psalm 91. Oh, you're good. Uh, we're going to continue studying through Psalms. Everybody get an outline? If we miss anybody? We've got extras if you need it. All right. Good deal. And uh, tonight we're going to look at Psalm 91, probably a familiar uh, psalm to many of you, at least a, a good portion of it. And we want to look at the topic tonight, In the Shadow of the Almighty. I don't know of a better place to be, amen, than uh, right snuggled up, close, nesting with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so we'll look at that topic tonight. Psalm 91, uh, as it starts to uh, unfold for us, um, it really teaches us a few things. It teaches, first of all, the trustworthiness of God. Uh, you can always count on him. You can always trust him. He never fails. And that's kind of how it starts off. Um, he makes a clear statement at the beginning of this psalm how much he trusts God. And, uh, of course, then he continues that and he says, I don't, I don't want you to just know that I trust God. He continues this psalm and he says, I want you to trust God and here's why. Uh, and he gives us some reason as to why we should trust God as well. And then he kind of closes out that psalm and he, he describes the benefits of uh, those who do trust God. And uh, so we want to break it down kind of into those thoughts tonight as we go through our outline. Uh, how many of you ever worked in a kitchen in a restaurant? Anybody? All right, a handful of you. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I don't want any details. I want, I want no details, okay? None. How many of you ever worked in a kitchen where if a customer walked into that kitchen, you said that customer would never come back? <laughs> okay, because maybe some things were being done that shouldn't be or some inappropriate uh, uh, cleaning procedures or whatever the case may be. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I go to a restaurant to eat, I don't like to think about what's happening in the kitchen. All right? l l the less I know, the better, right? And uh, <laughs> uh, thankfully, uh, in that particular area, ignorance is kind of bliss, right? But um, we, we blindly trust those workers to prepare our food properly, to cleanse everything properly, and then to give us that meal without any of the things that our mind might think is happening back there, right? We just kind of blindly try. I don't ever sit down at the restaurant and say, oh, what's your cook's name? What's he look like? How's he smell today? Um, did he bathe? Um, you know, is he, is he chewing tobacco while he's cooking my steak? Yeah, I, I don't do that, okay? I just, I just trust, right? And, and we do that for a lot of things really in life is we just kind of, I trust this is going to be the right thing. I trust this is going to happen. I'm just going to show up and do it. Um, here, here's the thing. In life, spiritually speaking, as Christians, uh, we have good news tonight. You can accept any circumstances in your life if you completely trust that the chef has your great, best interest in mind. Uh, he, he's never going to put on you something you shouldn't, you know, shouldn't have. He's never going to take you to a dirty kitchen, if you will, and you go, oh, I shouldn't have been here. He knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, and, and so we can really blindly trust him as well. If you study Psalm 91 like we will tonight, I, I hopefully it'll, it'll kind of deepen our trust relationship with our Savior. Uh, he's a God worthy of our trust. And we'll see that tonight as we lay out this psalm. Uh, the psalmist for Psalm 91 is not named. Uh, we don't know for sure who wrote this particular song. Most of them have a little tag and kind of tells you who it is. Uh, most people think that this can be attributed to Moses. Uh, some of the, uh, the language and stuff that he writes in this psalm kind of bears similarities to Deuteronomy. So you, you kind of can, eh, maybe, we don't know for sure, it doesn't matter. Not really, uh, but I'll just kind of give you a little background of the psalm here. Uh, so as you think of Psalm 91, we'll get into our outline tonight. I'll give you the three thoughts. We'll kind of break down the passage here into three sections. The first one, and I kind of mentioned this as a very introduction here, the statement of trust in God. The psalmist here begins this song or this psalm with a definitive statement, I trust in God, period. I'm not going to waver in that. I trust God. His choice to put his trust in God, uh, I'm sure, had been made before he wrote this psalm, or he wouldn't have wrote this psalm so confidently. Uh, he, he doesn't have a wishy-washy hope. Uh, he doesn't have uncertainty in his decision. I trust God. And, and we'll kind of see that here in these opening verses. So as you think about this opening statement of trust in God, let me give you a couple of thoughts. He starts out with the descriptions of God in verse 1 and 2. The, descript the descriptions of God, and we'll read these verses here in just a moment. Um, when we truly see God for who He is, what He does, what He's capable of, it's really not hard to say, I trust Him. I mean, you, I mean, you really know who He is and what He's done and His attributes and uh, the blessings He gives us in our life and how He works so, so miraculously so many times. It's not hard, really, to put our trust in Him. These first couple of verses, he gives us some descriptions of God and why we, in, in the statement of trust. Here's some of the reasons we trust God uh, because of who he is. Look at these descriptions of God. First of all, because of his ultimate position. 
his ultimate position. Look at uh, Psalm 91. We'll start reading through these verses here as we go through this. Look at verse number 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. His first reference to God is the Most High. The Most High. What comes to your mind when you think of the Most High? What do you think about when you think of somebody who uses that phrase, the Most High? Above everything. Nothing above Him. What's that? The highest. The highest of the high. I, I remember when I uh, was a senior in high school, we went to Washington, D.C. on our senior trip, and we went to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And if you've ever been there, it's an amazing experience. If you've never been there, I'd, I'd encourage you to get to go if you can. But uh, to watch that soldier as he's walking his paces back and forth, and uh, nothing falters those men, and just an amazing thing. And we were there, we were getting ready to present a wreath uh, as a class, a uh, senior class, our salutatorian valedictorian. We're going to salute a wreath uh, there at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And just as our time was arriving, for we had time slots because everything is ordered there and structured. Uh, we were getting ready, and they came and they told us we had to wait. And, you know, we're a bunch of, you know, 17, 18-year-old kids. We're like, what? It's our turn. Why do we have to wait? This isn't fair. We were supposed to go, you know, you know how we are, right? And they said, well, somebody else is here that holds a little bit more prestige than you seniors from Indiana. Anderson, Indiana, nothing else, all right? Somebody else a little bit more important than you is here to present a wreath, so we're going to give them your time slot, and you're going to go after them. Well, that's not fair. Who's more important than us? It was the Queen of England. It's the Queen of England, and I have pictures back when, you remember 35 millimeter cameras where you actually used to take the picture and take the roll in and get it developed? Yeah. My kids don't know what that is, but anyways, uh, I have pictures of me and the Queen of England from me to Bob. I mean, it's just an amazing experience. It was really cool. You know, I'm like, hey, Queen, you know, she, she's all prim and proper, but, uh, you know, you think about like the Queen of England, I think about, that's probably one of the most highest uh, positions in the, in, the, in the world, right, in these, in these kings and that kind of thing. You realize that God gives them their position. God gives them and enables them their authority. Uh, look, look at this thought about the ultimate position of God. I put down just a couple of scripture references. I put them up here on your outline. Look at Genesis 14, 22. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Uh, the ultimate position. Psalm 47, 2. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king. Not over his little country, over all the earth. Look, look at the next one. Uh, Psalm 83, 18. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. One more scripture, Psalm 92, 8. But thou, Lord, art most high for everyone. Isn't that an amazing thought when you think about the God that we serve, the God whose presence we get to go into, the shadow of, who, of whose presence we get to experience is the most high? What an ultimate position. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, if you remember back in Daniel chapter 4, uh, he as a king thought he was worthy of exaltation because he was the king of Babylon, remember? And he built this giant statue and everybody's supposed to, to bow down and worship him, remember? And he thought he deserved that. Um, of course... If you read through Daniel, at one point in his life, he, he lost his mind for seven years. And Nebuchadnezzar realized the absolute authority that the Most High held, and he did not compare. He did not compare. The psalmist here describes the place of the Most High as secret. He uses that word in verse number one, uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. What does secret mean? Oh, good. Unbeknownst to anyone else, hidden. What else? What's secret mean? Anybody have any other thoughts? Not known. Uh, it, it literally refers to, especially in this particular passage of Scripture, it's a sheltered or protected hiding place. So not only is it not known, it's also watched over and cared for and protected. And, and so the psalmist says this, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high. So this is a sheltered, protected hiding place that we find in God. Uh, that word secret, uh, when it's used here, uh, is talking about not just finding the presence of God, but also finding the protection of God when we're in His presence. The Most High, being close to Him is the most secure place to be ever in your life. Have you ever noticed when, you're, when you're in a, your spiritual relationship is close to God, how comfortable and peaceful and joyous and happy you are? But when you start to stray away from the presence of the Most High, what happens? 
life changes, <laughs> circumstances get a little harder, uh, the blessings uh, cease a little bit, I start feeling this change. It's not as comfortable, is it? Man, when we, the closer we get to God, the, the more we enjoy His presence, uh, the more we enjoy life, the more secure we are. Those who choose to dwell in the secret place of the Most High enjoy the security of His presence. He uses another word there in verse number one, he that dwelleth. He that dwelleth. What does the word dwell mean? What does it mean to dwell? Live? All right. You're, you're, what's that? Inhabit. All right. What's that? Stay somewhere. All right. Abide. Good. These are all good answers. Good answers. You didn't know you were going to get quizzed tonight, did you? Be prepared. <laughs> Pop quiz. Dwell. Dwell. It literally means settling down or remaining with constancy. So pretty much everything you all just said is what it means. It's, it's settling down. It's remaining with con- I'm going to stay here and abide here and live here and dwell here and not leave here until I'm dead. That's just where I'm going to be. That's where I'm going to stay. Uh, settling down. It's choosing to dwell. By the way, your relationship, this dwelling we're talking about in the secret place of the Most High, that is your choice. Okay, that's your decision. We have to choose to do that. God's not going to force us there. We choose that. And when that closeness with our Savior starts to wane, it's never Him backing away from us. It's always my choice as I back away from Him. Uh, the, the Most High here, uh, we, we choose to trust Him. We settle down and remain with Him. Why? Because He's easy to trust. Look at who He is. Look at who He is. Trusting God uh, is the prerequisite for the promise He lays out in the second part of verse number 1. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, so look at this thought. Here's the description of God. His ultimate position. Okay, we, we, we learn to trust in that. And then we see his almighty power. See, here, here, here's the question we have to ask ourselves as Christians. Will God bless me the way God's capable of blessing me if my trust and my faith in him is not what it should be? He's still going to bless. Obviously. He's still going to protect and provide for me. But how much am I going to miss out on? If my trust and my faith in him is not truly what it should be and solid like it should be. I get to experience his almighty power when my trust in his ultimate position is there. Does that make sense? And so those, those two things are kind of tied together, the psalmist says. Uh, you, you, you get to uh, uh, abide under the shadow of the almighty uh, if you dwell in the secret place. Does that make sense? And so look at that. Uh, look at, uh, we read verse number one. I'll just put it back up there on the screen for us again. But you see the prerequisite at the front. We dwell in the secret place and then... We get to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So when we truly trust in His ultimate position because of who He is, then we get to experience His ultimate power, His almighty power. What an all-powerful God we serve. Uh, If we trust in that power, we abide in His shadow, the Bible says. What does it take to be in someone's shadow? Walk beside them? What's it take? Strength, okay. Okay. I I can't walk in your shadow if I'm not beside you, number one. And I can't walk in your shadow if I'm not close to you. You see that? Your your shadow only goes so far. Do do, do you see what the psalmist is saying here? The closer you get to God, the the better off you are. Uh, The the more I dwell with him, the easier it is to stay in his shadow. Walking by this... Think about this. You, You ever see a child hesitant to cross the street? And then a trusted mom or dad, the parent comes along and says, give me your hand. And they just stride across with no problem and all kinds of confidence. Why? Somebody accompanied him. Somebody walked with him and by, by the side of his trusted parent. Do you, you realize that's our relationship with God? I can walk through life confidently, spiritually speaking, live life confidently, spiritually speaking, knowing I'm walking hand in hand with the Savior. And he's with me every step of the way. The psalmist clearly states that choosing to trust God is, is choosing to be next to the Almighty. Closeness, closeness. The third thing you see him describe is this. Uh, you see his, alt, or his absolute protection. His absolute protection. Let's get, uh, go down to verse number two. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. There you see that statement again. He's getting given that's that introductory statement of I trust in God. But he shows us here his absolute protection. He's referred to as a refuge in a fortress. Every time the Bible uses the word refuge, (laughs) if it uses that word, we're in trouble. Uh, Refuge or fortress, what's it referring to? 
Something designed for protection. Protection. Uh, we find security in a close relationship with God. Uh, we can relax even when the enemy is lurking outside the walls because we are secure in Christ and His protection. Uh, referring to the Lord here as a, as a refuge and a fortress, it's taking the idea of dwelling in the secret place of the Lord a step further. The psalmist saw himself not just next to the Lord, now he sees himself dwelling in the Lord. This is a, this is a close, intimate relationship that he has with his Savior. And that's how he's describing this trust. He's worthy of trust. Look at all these attributes. Look at the next thing. As he describes God in the statement of trust, the second thing you see is the decision to trust. The decision to trust. We read verse number 2 a minute ago. In the end of that verse, I'll put it back up for you. It says, in him will I trust. It doesn't say in him I might trust or I sometimes trust. I occasionally trust. In him will I trust trust. He states God's ultimate position, God's almighty power, God's absolute protection. And then he states that the Lord was his God. My God. He uses those two words in there. And then he closes that verse two and he says, you know what? God doesn't just make me feel safe and secure. He makes me safe and secure. It's more than a feeling. It's a reality. That's why I trust him. I don't just feel safety. I know I'm safe. I get that from God. You know, I put down a little, a little question here. It's a, more of a statement. I know, scary, huh? That was, that was uh, Emily this morning when she woke up. <laughs> Some folks feel this. I must feel safe and secure before I can decide to trust God. The reality of that statement is this. Feelings should not dictate decisions. They should follow decisions. When I allow my feelings to dictate my decisions, nine times out of ten, my decisions are wrong. Because feelings lead us astray, and my heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, right? Amen. So, so I make decisions based on biblical principles, and then I allow my feelings to follow. So I don't have to feel safe and secure before I can trust God. I trust God, and then I have feelings of safety and security. It's opposite of what, of what she would say there on that screen. David uh, was fleeing from Saul at one point in his life. He felt alone, felt abandoned, felt hopeless. But in 2 Samuel 22, 7, he makes the same statement that, that the psalmist makes here. He, I trust in the Lord. God's got this. His choice to trust made him safe, and then his feelings of safety followed. See, if we'll decide to trust God and decide that God can keep us safe, it's not hard then to allow our feelings to say, okay, I feel safe and secure. Because I put my trust in God. But it starts with that decision. Putting our trust in God. Turmoil often comes in our lives at us like a flood. Uh, it's in those times we have to renew our decision. I'm going to trust God even in the hard times. And I'm going to trust God every day I get up. And I'm going to trust God when I think it's bad. And when I think it's not going right. I'm going to trust God. This is the statement he makes. I know it's just two verses. But he puts a lot in those two verses when you think about it. Uh, the statement of, of, of trusting in God is so important. And so he makes that, and he starts the verse with uh, the chapter with that. Look at number two. Look at the solicitation then to trust in God. Again, he makes a statement, I trust in God. Now he wants to come at the reader and say, you need to trust in God. You need to trust in God. And, and here's some reasons why. Uh, it, it, verse 3 through 8 uh, tells us this. Uh, he, he continues with this, uh, this, this psalm, and he encourages us in the next few verses you trust in the Lord. And he gives us three, three pretty basic, simple reasons why we should trust in the Lord. The first one uh, is he will raise his feathers. You say, what, is he a bird? No, we understand the comparison, all right? Uh, the mother hen, right, taking care of the chicks. Uh, he will raise his feathers. Look at, look at verse 3 and 4 of our psalm. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. We'll come back to that in just a minute. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. The snare referred to here in verse number 3, the snare of the fowler, it's a trap set by a fowler or a bird catcher. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, that, that snare uh, it likens the snares with the work of the devil. Uh, and so we, we know to be aware of that. But this fowler, uh, these bird 
catchers, if you will, were particularly cunning. They would often take the young uh, of a bird that they were hunting, and they would take that young, and they would raise that young bird until it was tame. They would put the tame bird in a cage, and that bird would begin to call other birds uh, from its family and from its, you know, the similar like birds, and it would start attracting them. When a flock was gathered because that bird was calling, the fowler would come in with a snare. Uh, many times just a simple net, sometimes arrows, sometimes a, you know, a throwing stick or spear, and he would capture or kill those birds that came in when that young bird in the cage there was calling. A surprise attack. Boy, doesn't that sound like the enemy today? He lures us in. He's standing at the sidelines. <laughs> and what's he do? Sneak attack. <laughs> Sneak attack. Even a surprise attack, though, like the fowler here, cannot trap those who truly trust in the Lord because we know the Lord's on our side and the Lord's got victory for us. God also promises uh, in that verse 3, uh, He promises to deliver us from the noisome pestilence. That word pestilence is also plague. Uh, Plagues are devastating, aren't they? Uh, they run through a population as if they're a living thing. I mean, you think about even COVID right now, and you think about some of the devastation and destruction it's, it's wreaked across our world. Um, our superior medical knowledge and plagues still threaten us. As advanced as we are, technology and all that, science, and yet, yet a plague can still come in, a pestilence can still come in and cause a whole bunch of problems. Um, we cannot absolutely control the spread and the, and the harmful effects, but I'm thankful that God can, if that's God's decision. Uh, in the midst of terrifying uncertainty, like a plague, God can be trusted. Uh, God can be trusted at all times, and we're thankful for that. And, and so we see that when he talks about the pestilence there. Uh, God, uh, one thing we need to understand about God is, is this. He cares for his children. Right, And we know that. Uh, just like that mother bird cares for her young and will protect them at all costs. Do you realize that's our God? He cares for us. He protects us. He, he gathers us under his wings and, and comforts us in that fashion. When God raises his feathers, everybody that loves him and trusts him should come around it. Amen? Because he's there to protect us. If you look at verse number four, you see a contrast between the, bird, uh, the bird's uh, wing. And then you see the, the, the shield and buckler mentioned at the end of verse number four. Shield and buckler are, are, are strong things that offer secure protection. The shield uh, was, would be the receiver of the brunt of an enemy's arrows. If somebody were to shoot an arrow or even a, a, a spear or something like that, the shield would take the force of that from, from, the, from the person defending himself. Aren't you thankful that God is the shield and that God defends and wards off the attacks of Satan or the fiery darts he talks about uh, that he throws at us? The shield, God takes care of that. Uh, and we realize the grief many times that we are spared because we simply trust him to direct our path. And we trust him uh, to protect us and, and to take care of his children. Uh, the next thing you see is this. You see he'll raise his feathers. So that's why we ought to uh, trust the Lord. But the second thing you see is verse 5 and 6, he will remove our fear. He will remove our fear. <coughs> Excuse me. How many of you are afraid of something tonight? The rest of you, you nothing afraid? You, not, you ain't afraid of nothing? Man, you guys are brave. I'm going to throw a rattlesnake in your car after church. <laughs> I'm afraid. I hate snakes. I hate them with a passion. I don't care if it's one of them little. It's harmless. It's hurting me. Get it out of here. I don't want it. I won't see it. All right? I was with Noah the other day. We were out looking at something, and uh, the lady was showing us around, and she said, uh, uh, now, if you, if you hear me scream and go run, it's because I saw a snake. I said, I'll outrun you, honey. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> I'm going to be waiting around to see what you're running from. <laughs> if it's a snake, I'm out of here, right? <laughs> you afraid of snakes, Eddie? No? Shut up, Eddie. Don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> yeah. Five foot, huh? That's taller than you. <laughs> Nolan? Did you get one? Thank you. Yeah, well, make sure you're walking around the property you watch. Yeah. Yeah. Keep your eyes and your ears open because they do start to come to the building for, for warmth when it's a little chilly. So, yeah, keep your eyes open. 
If you get bit by a rattlesnake, don't sue us, please. All right? It's not our fault. <laughs> I'm kidding. We'll, Lord will protect you there, too, but we, gotta be, we still have to use, use, use due diligence there. But we all have fears. We all have phobias. Uh, we all have issues, you know. And it might not be I'm, I'm terrified. You know, kind of, but there, there are things in life that, that scare us, and we think about, wow, I hope I don't have to face that situation. You ever been alone in the dark and heard a strange noise? Man, that is that is terrifying, isn't it? What was that? What was that? Um, you ever you ever been on a youth trip and slept in the church? You go into camp or something like that, and the church says, You can stay in our church for free. You don't have to buy a motel for all your teenagers. You can sleep in the auditorium. And you go in there and you turn off all the lights, you go to sleep, and you hear church buildings make some horrendous noises. Scary. Darkness plays a part <laughs> in heightening our fears. I'll never forget. I told Larry the story not too long ago, but uh, I uh, walked into the, our church in Indiana several years back, and I walk in the side entrance of the church, and there's a long hallway. And about halfway down that hallway, there's a little door so we can separate the parts of the building, and you can kind of lock that door if you're having different activities or whatever. And uh, that door, it never is closed unless we're doing something like that. And I walked in one morning really early, and that church was old and creaky, so you already hear noises every step you take, and it's terrifying. You're the only one in the building, and you're hearing noises, but uh, I hadn't quite had a moment to flip on the light. Uh, hands were full or something. I don't remember what it was, but I walked in that door, and I looked down the hallway, and there was a man standing there. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. It's dark. I'm by myself, and I walk into an empty, what I thought was an empty church, and there was a man standing there. My first response was, well, good thing I'm carrying. I can at least you know, scare him. I'm not going to shoot him, but at least I can scare him. And I started to reach for my gun, and he started to reach for his gun. And I thought, oh, boy, shoot out the OK Corral, baby. What's going to happen here? And as I went to pull, I, I moved this way, and he moved this way. And I moved this way, and he moved that way. And I realized something. That door that had a window in it, the, the custodian had left closed. And I was staring at myself down the hallway, and I almost shot myself in the door. <laughs> Shut up, Roger. <laughs> I tell that story and laugh about it now, but I was terrified. <laughs> I was scared out of my wits. I think I turned around and went home. I don't even think I went to work that day. I think I turned around and went home and went back to bed. But <laughs> we, we all face fears. <laughs> you know, one of the hardest part about fears, especially with, when dark's involved, is not being able to see the enemy. Not being able to see what you're afraid of. Of course, the terror of the daytime is being able to see the enemy. So it doesn't work. You know, either way, there's problems, but there's no rest for those that are running from fear. Uh, I'm thankful that God can remove all fear. I'm thankful that God can take care of that. Look at, look at verse 5 and 6 here. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth, uh, or that wasteth at noonday. God's got all the bases covered. Any, any type of fear that we might have at any time of day or for any situation, God says this, I, I can remove that. I, I can protect you from that. I can give you peace through that. I can give you rest for your soul. I'm the almighty God. I can handle that. His presence chases away our fears and gives us peace. I'm thankful for that tonight. Look at this, this third challenge here, a solicitation to trust in God. He has this in verse 7 and 8. He will reward your foes. You say, wait a minute. Why is he going to reward my foes? Well, let's look at the verses and let's see the reward, all right? Verse 7 and 8. A thousand shall fall at thy side. Uh, and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Their reward's not a good reward, okay? God takes care of us, and the enemies, the wicked, will not go unpunished. Uh, you know, he says here in this psalm that, you know, it's not even going to get close to us. God's going to take care of that. God's going to take care of the destruction and the judgment that they need. They will not escape the wrath of God. Now, I don't rejoice in that fact. But I'm thankful that I can trust his protection in my life, uh, that he's going to take care of my fears, but he's also going to reward my foes. He, he's going to take care of that. So, so the psalmist says this, I trust in God. Let me give you three quick reasons why you should. And then he closes the psalms in the rest of these verses, and he shows us this, the safety of those who trust in God. Here's the benefits. 
Okay, he's made his bold statement. He's given us three challenges on why we should trust in God. Now he says, here's the conclusion. Let me show you why we should trust in God. A couple of reasons. First of all, because of the assurance of safety. We have the assurance of safety. Look at verse 9 and 10, and we see the assurance of safety. Um, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. That's that dwelling place. That's that uh, secret spot we're talking about. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Uh, what an encouragement. Uh, the solicitation for us to trust, Lord, this, this is pretty convincing. The psalmist says it's worth it. Look at the benefits. Look at the rewards. Uh, I, I expect you to choose to trust God like I do uh, because the rewards are, are, are great. Look, but look at verse number 9. He's pretty confident that because of what he's described, we should trust the Lord and we will. He doesn't say, if you have made the Lord... What does he say? Because. He's saying, I expect you to. I trust him, and here's why. Here's, here's why you should. I, if you don't take me up on this, you're, you're a knucklehead. He doesn't say if. He says, because you have trusted in the Lord, which is our refuge. Uh, he's laid out the benefits of trusting God in the first, uh, first verses, 3 through 8. Now he simply summarizes them and says, this is great for you. <laughs> this is wise for you. Uh, this, is, this is the assurance you have of safety. Look at the next thing he gives us. Uh, he shows us the means of safety. The means of safety. Verse 11 through 13. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou uh, trample under feet. Hey, now we're getting the snakes back. Amen. Trample under her feet. The psalmist elaborates on the means that the Lord employs to ensure safety to his children. The first means in verse number 11 is the angelic host. Aren't you thankful that God gives the angels charge over us? You ever hear somebody say like, man, I think I killed my guardian angel today. I think I've been through about a million and six, all right? Uh, but I'm thankful that God uses the angelic host to protect his children. We don't always see it. We don't always understand it. But the Bible says he gives them charge. In a general sense, the angels are used many times to keep or protect believers. We're thankful for that. They make a difference in our lives. But verse number 12, uh, it says that they, they kind of intervene and help us uh, prevent harm. Uh, verse 12, it talks about how they'll bury the up lest I dash thy foot against the stone. By the way, you also remember this is the, uh, this is the same uh, uh, phrase or quote that the devil uses to try to get Jesus to jump off the pinnacle, remember? Oh, the angels. God doesn't bless stupidity, folks. All right, He protects, but if I'm going to be stupid... That's all me, right? And I think God, God, I think Jesus realized that as well when the devil was tempting him with this. But uh, the, the angels make a difference in our lives. They intervene. They keep us from harm. And you ever gotten out of some situation you thought for sure you, there was no way out of it? And somehow you did, and it, you had to have some sort of angelic help. God had to intervene somehow, some way, some form, some fashion. And you know that. Uh, and God does that for us. It's the means of safety. He gives the believers, in verse number 13, he gives us strength for the way that we walk. Treading on the lion and, and cobra, that word dragon, it's actually a cobra, an adder, that's a snake, uh, is extraordinary. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine walking through a, uh, uh, we'll just use a rattlesnake since we saw one. Can you imagine a rattlesnake and just go, oh, I'll just step on that. God will protect me. I don't know that I'm ready for that yet. Okay? Because, again, God doesn't bless stupidity. This, again, this is, this is talking about some things that God does for us. He protects us. And I know this is an illustration we use here, but I, I'm not going to, you know, go go face to face with a lion and see if I can defeat it. Okay, I'm not dumb. But God protects his children. And that's the, that's the message the psalmist is trying to get across to us. God will use any means necessary, whether it's his angelic force, whether it's providing us with some sort of strength that will help us in our journey. God strengthens us to meet the challenges of life as we choose to trust and obey. Um, what, is, what does Philippians say in chapter 4, verse 13? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Uh, so, so we see that. He, he strengthens us. So, so he kind of closes out that thought and he says, yeah, this, uh, listen, I trust God. Here's why you should. This is the safety it provides. I'm just assuming you've made this decision. And then we close the psalm, t finally, with everything. Uh, we see the salvation of those who trust in God. The salvation of those who trust in God. The last three verses, 14, 15, and 16. What's that? Satis what did I say? Oh, sal it's satisfaction, yeah. Read the screen, Eddie. <laughs> I don't always say what's up there, all right? <laughs> the satisfaction of those who trust in God. 
He's, he's telling us it's worth trusting him. He's showing us why. He's giving us the reasons, uh, you know, and all that. And now he's saying, you be satisfied if you do. The last three verses here, God is speaking. This changes, this, is, this changes speakers right in the middle of this, or the end of this psalm. The psalmist is telling us all this stuff, and now God steps into these last three verses and says, Oh, by the way, here's the satisfaction you will find if you put your trust in me. What does he show us? First of all, they're lifted up. They're lifted up. Verse number 14. Verse number 14. Let me get it up there. Here we go. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. What, what, a, what an encouraging uh, promise from God. He will lift us up. He will take care of us. Loving God, of course, I believe is, is equivalent with knowing God and trusting God. They all go hand in hand. Uh, when I decide to trust God, I decide to love God. When I decide to love God more, I learn that my trust in God strengthens as well. They, go, they work together. In response to love, the Lord says this, I'll deliver you. I, I, I'll set you up on high where you'll be safe. Uh, God is in control, and he can give us peace and assurance. Uh, so he says that, first of all, uh, you'll be lifted up. The second thing we see is satisfaction is this. We're listened to. Ladies, do you ever wish your husband would just listen? <laughs> he may have heard you, but did he listen, right? Look at verse 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. Not might, not maybe, not, not think about it. I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. We see that when God, uh, when, when our trust in God is established and strengthened, God declares those that will trust him, I will listen to you if you just call. What, what does Jeremiah say? Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. We see all kinds of, of encouragements and, and, and admonitions in Scripture to call upon the Lord and take Him our troubles and cast. We see that all throughout Scripture. God will listen to His children. He promises His presence in the midst of trouble. I will be with Him in trouble. You ever get in trouble? <laughs> yeah? Uh, we've all been there at some point in our life. Isn't it nice to know God goes with us even into the troubling circumstances of life? God's presence in the trouble is just as effective and comforting as our being out of trouble. If we truly trust in Him. So, 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 so the satisfaction we find in putting our trust in Him. Uh, we're listened to. We're lifted up. And then lastly, we enjoy long life. There's only, there's only a couple times in Scripture where it talks about uh, helping us to enjoy a longer life. Uh, one of those is, of course, children obeying our parents. We see another reference made to this in verse number 16. Look, look at the last verse of the chapter. With long life will I satisfy Him and show Him my, oh, show him my salvation. There you go. With long life will I satisfy him. A long life is promised to those who place their trust in God. Now, that word long, of course, is open to interpretation. But think about it. Probably the more trust I put in Christ, the longer I am allowing myself to live because the less I trust Christ, the more I trust me, the more trouble I get into, the more opportunity I have to do wrong, the more opportunity I have to mess up my life, the more opportunity I have to kill myself a little bit earlier. That makes sense? <laughs> Let's say that again. <laughs> uh, I can't, you're right. So the more I trust in him, the more I put my life in his hands. Uh, the longer I can trust him to, to sustain my life. Those who choose to trust God and live for him find satisfaction in this life, but also in eternity. Uh, see, because life here on earth will end, but life there will go on forever. Many people try to find satisfaction in life by trying to control every aspect of their life. They ultimately will fail. Only those who humbly trust God have the promise of satisfaction in life, even in spite of their circumstances. I want to close with this, okay? I'm going to give you this, and you get to fill in the blank, okay? My life would be a lot better if... Fill in the blank. Somebody, somebody, anybody. Not all at the same time. I won't be able to hear you. If I trusted Him more, what else? If I love him more. All right, let's take this from a different angle. What would the world say? My life would be a lot better if. If I had more money. If my mother-in-law wasn't so. No, I'm kidding. If I had the job that I always craved. If I had. Uh, if my wife was more like. Or my husband was more like. This is the world, right? 
If I lived in a different place, if I was taller, if I was shorter, if I had more hair. These are things that people really desire in life that say, my life would be so much better, you know. We're, we're going to do this exercise. Nolan ruined it already, but that's okay. I'm glad he said it. Re- repeat this phrase. You ready? My life would be a lot better if. Okay, let's try it one more time. My life would be a lot better if. I learn to trust God more. That's the reality. Uh, all those other things, you know, could come along the way. That's what God wants if I learn to trust Him. Because He always has His best interest in mind as well as my best interest at heart. Uh, he knows what He's doing in my life. I've just got to learn to trust Him. The psalmist comes out and he says, I trust God. And here's why. Do it. Try it. You'll like it. You remember that? Was it, was, was it the, uh, what was that cereal commercial? Mikey. Life, life cereal, right? Give it to Mikey. He'll like it. Mikey eats anything, right? God says this. If you trust me, the psalmist says here, here's the re- just, just do it. You'll like it. I promise. It'll be good. It'll be good. Trust God. The, the closing thought for the lesson, kind of gone through the, the whole lesson here, is to find peace and satisfaction just by trusting God. What are the difference that will make in our lives if we'll just trust him more? And the psalmist knew it. He encouraged us to do so. Next week, uh, actually, it'll be... Yeah, no, I won't be here next week. Larry will be here next week. Dun, dun, dun. And I think you're going to, are you finishing a lesson or, could, or piggybacking off a lesson that you did the first of the month? Second part of it. So, so if you weren't here the first uh, part, of it, it was the second, I believe was the date. You can go on YouTube or Facebook and watch it if you want uh, or, or watch it again to catch you back up. And he's going to finish off that, uh, that uh, this Wednesday. So I will be in uh, suffering for Jesus in sunny Florida. On the beach. <laughs> While my daughter's in school getting all her stuff in order, I'm going to be on the beach. I hope she's okay. Anyways, when I get back, Psalm 127, read ahead. Uh, dependent parents. And yes, it is it's what we're literally going to talk about, parenting. And uh, I know some of you may say, well, I'm, I'm done. My kids are growing. i got grand- grandkids now. Uh, it's going to be some helpful thoughts, I think, to those that are young parents, those who are old parents, those who are grandparents. Uh, just some thoughts on what the scripture teaches us, uh, depending on God more in our parenting than on Dr. Spock. God knows a whole lot more. Amen. Amen. We get all of our blanks filled in? We get all of our words said correctly, Eddie? All right, good. All right. Any questions, comments, thoughts? You're, you're very welcome. Roger, do you have some? Men's breakfast Saturday at 8, yes. Carl Ewing at 11. Yes. Is it 11? 11. Yes. Yeah, 11. Benson Baptist Church. Somewhere down near the school. Yeah, it's, it's down in there, tucked away somewhere. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pray then. We'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your blessings. Thank you for being a trustworthy God, a God who shows himself mighty and powerful, a God who is worthy of our trust. Lord, we know you'll never let us down. You have our, our best interest in mind, Lord. We're thankful for that. And uh, you take care of us. You protect us. You give us peace and safety. We're thankful for that. And Lord, may we just learn as Christians even, no matter how long we've been saved, may we learn to continually trust you more with our lives. Uh, we know it'll be a benefit for us in our lives if we do so. Uh, Father, we ask you now tonight as we go home, just uh, give us safety as we travel. Uh, be with a long list of prayer requests that have been mentioned now tonight as well. And uh, be with us this week, the rest of this week. May we live for you. Uh, may we tell others about you, Lord. May we make a difference here on this earth, we pray. Uh, bless our activities coming up uh, over the weekend. Bless the Sunday services, we pray. And prepare us now, Lord, for everything you'd have for us this weekend. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two on your way out. And we will see men Saturday, and the rest of you will see Sunday. <laughs>